and we're going to move along through the goddess, and then we're going to uh, talk about French cathedrals, and we're going to talk about alignment of the planets, and we're going to talk about the spirit that permeates religion today. And so I'll give you a short outline of what we'll be dealing with this morning. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the lesson today. Father, I pray for the gift of teaching, and I pray that you give me wisdom in the Word of God, and I pray you'd open the hearts of the people to receive your Word, in thy holy name, amen. All right, now turn to Luke chapter number 1 and verse 48 with me this morning. Luke 1, 48. Luke the Apostle, chapter number 1 and verse number 48. This is what's called the Magnificat, and it's Mary praying. And she says in verse 48, For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Now note that very carefully. Blessed. All right, now was Mary blessed? Is, is she one of a kind? Absolutely. None before, none since. She's one of a kind. Mary remains unique throughout eternity. Mary will be unique because she's the virgin mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, her, that's who she is. That cannot be taken away from her. But here's the problem when you go further than that. I want you to notice carefully what she said. All generations shall call me blessed. Now go to the book of Luke. Chapter number 11, same book now, same book. Luke 11, verse 27. Luke chapter number 11, verse 27. Now watch carefully. We're talking about the same Luke who recorded what, was, what you heard in Luke 1, 48. Luke 11, 30, uh, 27. It came to pass as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb of that bear thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. All right, now does that go along with uh, what Luke 1 48 says? Yeah. We read the next verse. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. You know what he just did? He rebuked her. He rebuked her for going back to Mary. He rebuked her for pulling Mary into the equation. And this is a clear rebuke. Now, this is, a, this is tough for those who have elevated Mary above the position of the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter number seven and verse number five, it talks about his brethren, neither did his brethren believe in him. John seven and verse number five. And uh, it, this reference to brethren is a reference to uh, his brothers and his family. And so uh, he did have brothers. He did have a family. He had, a, he had a immediate family here on this earth. These are not cousins we're talking about. And it says they didn't believe in him. In Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 46 through 50, we have a little incident that takes place. Matthew chapter number 12 and verses 46 through 50. Matthew 12, verse 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said to him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. Now watch this. But he answered and said to them, uh, unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? That's another rebuke. In plain words, I'm preaching to these people. What I'm preaching here and what I'm doing here is far more important than what I might be doing, speaking with my mother and my brethren. And then he continues to say in verse 50, Whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Another rebuke. And Luke 8 records the same event. But John chapter number 2 and verse number 4 we get, into the, we get into a very clear, the Lord Jesus is making a very clear separation between his earthly existence as the son of Mary and his, uh, and his, uh, and his complete nature as the God-man. Luke chapter number 2 and verse 4, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, 
What have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Saying woman. He could have said mother, but he said woman. All right, now I want you to go with me in chapter, chapter number 19 of the Gospel of John, verse 25. John 9. I know we're moving fast, but I got a lot of stuff. And uh, John chapter number 19 and verse number 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. This is loaded with meaning. And the meaning is this, Mary, I love you. You're the woman that brought me into the world. But your relationship with me can only be as any other sinner. I am your Savior. You do not from henceforth call me your son like there is some special relationship. I am your Lord God Almighty. That's your son, pointing to the Apostle John, who took her to his house. That's my interpretation of that text. And I think the reason for this is because the Scripture, as it says in the book of Galatians, foreseeing, written word of God, being able to prophetically look into the future, the Scripture foreseeing, I think you, what you have here is the Scripture foreseeing the hour that we're living in today where people have elevated Mary, the mother of Jesus, into a goddess state. And that's what we're dealing with. Mary is called the mother of God in the Roman Catholic Church and others, Theotokos. In 4 something AD, the Council of Ephesus, Nestorius, the Archbishop of Constantinople. Now, how many know where Constantinople is? Okay, and that's the Eastern. Just remember this, it's in Turkey. It's in, it's in, the, it's in that strait that, that, that joins Europe and Asia. Remember that the, that, that, that the bishop, the Archbishop, the head of the church at Constantinople is the head of the Eastern branch of the church. That's the head of it. The western branch is in Rome. The eastern branch is in Constantinople. Nestorius went to the council of Ephesus to clarify his position on Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Already by 400 AD, they were calling her the mother of God. And giving her this title, mother of God, Nestorius says, I don't, I don't accept that. She is the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. But God Almighty, when, she say, when you're saying that she's the mother of God, now think what I'm telling you. Think about this for a moment. If you are saying that she is the mother of God, you're saying that God came forth from Mary and the mother precedes the son. And this is what we're going to be talking about. That may very well be what they intended, that they give lip service to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the real homage and, and worship goes to Mary. Now here's the problem. When you get into Mary, when you get into Mary, which Mary are you talking about? Are you talking about the Mary that the people who come to the churches and sit in the pews and say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now in the hour of our death? Are you talking about these people or are you talking about the clergy, the leadership, the elite in the church who know that what the people are talking about is not the same one they're talking about? That there's something going on much greater and much deeper and much more sinister than what simply the people in the pews are saying. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about Mary, the mother of God. Was God born of a woman? No. Absolutely not. Was the God-man born of a woman? Yes. When did that happen? That happened when God became a man. That's what's called the incarnation. God was incarnate as a man. And, the ma and listen carefully. The man, Christ Jesus, did not come down from heaven. God came down from heaven and merged in human flesh to become the God-man 2,000 years ago. What I just said to you is a profound statement. If the Jehovah's Witnesses ever got that right, they would understand that the Lord Jesus Christ was not something that was inferior to God. 
He was God of very God manifest in the flesh. But that's, you know, we believe that. And I've never met a Christian that had any problem believing that. But let's look carefully at what all we're talking about when we talk about this. I'm going to do a little reading for you. And I want you to just listen because I'm sure most of this is new. Uh, but it'll start coming together for you. Just read. Just, just listen to what I'm reading now. During the Renaissance, the medieval period when the occult traditions flooded Europe from Mideast, Chartres Cathedral was built on a sacred site in France where ancient Druids worshipped the mother goddess. Now what is, and I'm not sure I pronounced this correct, C-H-A-R-T-R-E-S. That's a French word. Does anybody know any, any French? <laughs> That's one language that I flat stumble through. I hope I'm Chartres, C-H-E or Chartres or whatever. But anyway, it is one of the most famous cathedrals in the world. Uh, how many has ever heard of Notre Dame? All right. Notre Dame de Paris, or Notre Dame de Paris, all right? That literally means Our Lady of Paris. That's what the word Notre Dame means, Our Lady. But did you know that there are many more Notre Dames in France than just the one in Paris? And that every single one of these cathedrals has a reason for being and a reason for being where they are. In plainer words, geographically on the map of France, they are located for a specific reason. And we'll talk about that in a little while. They are named Notre Dame of Chartres, or Notre Dame of this, or Notre Dame of that, Our Lady of, Our Lady of, Our Lady of. Now, when you begin to think about it, you say, well, now, what's going on here? There's a lot going on. And this is what I mentioned to you a few minutes ago about the fact that the Virgin Mary, the Virgin Mary, was a real woman who lived 2,000 years ago, a virgin daughter of Zion, that God Almighty impregnated by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, and she brought forth the God-man, God manifest in flesh. That's who the Lord Jesus is, folks, the God-man. But Mary of the Catholic Church and of the other Orthodox, many of the Orthodox churches, the Mary of those churches may not be the Mary that most people think she is. You remember what I told you about North Africa and the hotbed of, uh, North Africa was a hotbed of, of, diver of, of religious diversity 2,000 years ago. And I told you that the tablets, the, the Nag Hammadi, Gnostic Gospels were found 1947 in North Africa. And these Gnostic Gospels paint an entirely different picture of Mary Magdalene than the Bible does. All right? And that North Africa, according to the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 44, when Israel had gone off into North Africa, they had gone into North Africa, they'd been driven from their country. They were in Jeremiah 7 and Jeremiah 44, they were baking cakes to the Queen of Heaven. And then in Jeremiah 44, Jeremiah rebuked them for their worship of the Queen of Heaven. And where are they? They're in North Africa. Where do we find the Gnostic Gospels? North Africa. Where does this Neoplatonism that we're talking about, this, uh, we're going back into these, into these pagan religions? North Africa. So it becomes the hotbed, the seedbed. It becomes the springboard for all of the perversion that finds itself permeating itself on out into the, into the religious world 2,000 years ago. When Dan Brown wrote his uh, money-making book on the Da Vinci Code and eventually became a movie, uh, he had researched what I'm giving you this morning. I'm only giving you a part of it. There's a whole lot more than this. But he had researched this and being an author and able to, to spin the thing to suit himself, he made a lot of money. But the thesis of his book is that there is a there was a union between Mary Magdalene and the Lord Jesus Christ, physical union, that produced a child. Therefore, a bloodline came from them. And this bloodline uh, was protected through what's called the Priory of Sion and through the Merovingian king or line of kings and located in France. And that this Merovingian line of kings, this bloodline, this this bloodline of Mary Magdalene and the Lord Jesus Christ will eventually, uh, will eventually produce a ruler over this world. 
and they're waiting for the time for this to happen. And that uh, they, now you know a lot of you, so well, I don't believe a bit of it. It doesn't make any difference whether we believe it or not. They do. That's the point. They believe it. And uh, when, who, you, who are they? They're the ones who pull the strings of the puppets that you see before you right now. The puppet that's in the White House, the puppets that run in the European, the puppet, the puppet, the puppet. Puppets come, puppets go. But it seems like the same agenda continues to flow. Right? It seems like we're continuing down the same path, same track, for a predetermined end, regardless of who is in power. Which tells me that there's somebody up here above the ones that you see that continue their agenda. Oh, they, let, they had let enough change for, you know, for you feel like, well, let's throw the bums out. So you throw the bums out and they put another bum in. And some, a few things have changed, but you still got a bum. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, mo a lot of people in the know say the, really on, the, re the only real difference between a Democrat and a Republican is the way you spell their name. <laughs> but, well, you know, the bottom line is, I mean, where are we? This is, this is 2015. Have things gotten any better or are they worse? We had eight years of George Bush. Now, we've had six years of Barack Obama. Obama will be gone in a couple of years, but another one will come on. So, you know, the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, all this has been going on for 2000, well, more than 2,000 years, and it continues apace. And so, when we look at this thing, we're looking at something that has been, that's something that has been 2,000 years ago in the making to come to the point we are today. It didn't happen overnight. None of this stuff can happen overnight. These people are laying their plans and they know exactly what they're doing and they have a predetermined end. They will bring forth a one world ruler. They will. Now let's come back to France. You know, just a few days ago, a, a, a madman, a Muslim went in and he shot to death uh, some, uh, uh, some people who produced a filthy magazine. Filthy as it can be. Charlie Abdo, Abdo, who, what's, whatever the name of that thing was. That was a piece of filth. But on the other hand, I'm an American. I'm an American. I believe in the freedom of religion. I believe in the freedom of speech. I believe you ought to have the freedom to do something like that. Although I don't agree with it, because if I take that away, they can come and take mine away. But the, of course, we're talking about France, but France is the one who gave us Lady Liberty out here in, in, uh, you know, in the Bay up there in New York City. Anyway, in the ones of the French Revolution I talked to you about last week when Marie Antoinette and King uh, uh, Louis the Sixteenth, and they led her to the guillotine, and they chopped her head off, and they overthrew the, uh, the French monarchy, and they had egalitarian, liberty, and fraternity were the three basic uh, principles of that French people who loved liberty, the French people who loved what's right, and all of that. All right, so they go in over there and they kill these people in France. All right, France, back about 1200 A.D., all of a sudden, had these magnificent cathedrals begin to pop up all over the country. And uh, Notre Dame that I was telling you about just a moment ago in Paris was one of them. Some of them were built on the sites of previous cathedrals. But they all had one thing in common. If you take the constellation Virgo, for example, which is in the pagan world, it represents the virgin goddess. Now, let me say something here. I know I'm giving you a lot of stuff. I realize that, and we'll go back over this just like I did about the Merovingian. I'm giving you a lot. But in the pagan world, a virgin does not mean the same thing as a virgin in the Bible. All right? Especially the Gnostics in the New Age. It does not mean the same thing. But the constellation Virgo is a representation of the goddess Isis, which was the goddess of North Africa. 2,000 years ago. This goddess Virgo has stars in her constellation. And you can go out and see these. It's a consistent thing. You can take the pattern of the stars that's in Virgo, certain ones that are laid out up there, and you look at them. You can take them and superimpose them on a map of France. In plain words, you're laying it down on a map of France and you would be amazed at the corresponding cathedrals that were built exactly where those stars would be superimposed on France. Now think about that for a minute. That's mind-boggling. That's mind-boggling. 
to go back 800, 900 years, go back 900 years, and they start building these cathedrals, and they build them in geographical locations across France that correspond to the stars Virgo. Now, what does that say? Well, that says there's something about Virgo that's very important to whoever it was that built these things because obviously they were, they, they were connected. We're not talking about isolated cases. We're talking about these people are connected. These people, these people are in, uh, they're corresponding with each other. They, they have the same mindset. All of this is going on. Now, this is what's called sacred geometry. And sacred geometry is when you have something on the earth that corresponds with something in the heavens. And this, this uh, it, it, it could either be a physical ge geographical location or it could, be, it could be something that has been placed there, in plain words, something man-made, an artifact, in a location. But there's a reason for it. It's got a message behind it. You say, well, I don't know what the message is. You're not really supposed to know what the message is. The elite know what the message is. The initiate. They know what the message is. Remember the puppets? The one who pulls the strings? All right. That's the one who knows what it means. And uh, it's amazing how stuff continues to fit the agenda. So now what I'm going to read to you this morning here about this, this uh, uh uh, about what's going on in France is going to lay the groundwork of what's going on right in your back door. Let me give you an, let me, look, how many of you got a paper there? How many of you got the paper of the, uh, right, look at that for just a moment. Did everybody get one? I hope so. All right, that's a woman, right? That's a pyramid behind her, right? She's got a, uh, she's got a rosary in her hand. And she's got a cross, crucifix, right? You've got coexist written across the bottom. See that? All right. Now, you say, who is that? She's a goddess. All right? That's a goddess. Not God, masculine. Goddess, feminine. And for some time now, the whole structure of the church, the Christian church, has been turned upside down, and it is now feminine, instead of masculine. But anyway, what are you looking at? You're looking at a goddess, all right? You're looking at coexist across the bottom. All right, there's a pyramid behind her. I was driving down with my brother over here, Brother Caldwell, the other night. We were driving down the interstate going to the hospital. And I looked off to the right-hand side and there stood a obelisk. I mean, it was lit up. It was lit up, an obelisk with a pyramid on top of it, and the pyramid was lit up more than the obelisk. I thought to myself, uh-oh, <laughs> that, that ought to be a red flag real fast. It ought to jump up and say, hold on a minute. What's going on here? Well, let me show you what's going on. Now, you know that, uh, as I told you before, uh, the, uh, the present uh, spiritual condition of the world is moving in a certain direction. Now, how many of you folks know Katy Perry? I never met her, no, but I know of her. That's what I, I should say, no of her. And uh, I, this is nothing against Katy Perry. I'm simply using her as an illustration of many, many, many people. I'm going to give you the mindset. This is the way people think today. And this young lady right here was raised in a Christian home. She at one time professed to be born again. But since then, uh, her life has moved in a different direction. I would ask you today to pray for Katy Perry. And please pray for her family because I'm sure her daddy's heart is broken. Because I think her daddy is a minister, a preacher. And, but in any event, listen carefully. She gave an interview to a, uh, to a magazine. And uh, uh, let's see if i got that magazine's name. Here it is, Mar Marie Claire Magazine. Marie Claire Here's what she said. Here's an excerpt from the interview. Perry's left behind her born-again past and finds, now listen carefully, this is a buzzword, spirituality, through the writing of Eckhart Tolle. Who is that? That is a New Age pagan writer. The power of now influenced the song this moment. Practicing transcendental meditation, 
The best thing I got out of my previous relationship because it was introduced to me via my ex-husband and therapy. She says, I don't believe in a heaven or a hell or an old man sitting on a throne. I believe in a higher power bigger than me because that keeps me accountable. Accountability is rare to find, especially with people like myself because nobody wants to tell you something you don't want to hear. I actually don't trust people who start to turn on me because they get scared of me telling the truth. I'm not Buddhist, I'm not Hindu, I'm not Christian, but I still feel like I have a deep connection with God. I pray all the time for self-control, humility. There's a lot of gratitude in it. Just saying thank you sometimes is better than asking for things. All right, now, you know, this is nothing personal against Katy Perry. I'm using her as an example. There are millions of people who hold the same philosophy as her. What is that? There is a higher power. And I marvel how that when I begin to read deeper into their philosophies and their belief system, that the higher power usually winds up being feminine. Goddess movement has been big in the United Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church of the United States, USA. It's been big in mainline Protestant churches, also in the Catholic churches. The goddess movement is a big deal today. Uh, I think a lot of Baptists, and probably it's okay, are shielded from a lot of this because you certainly don't hear it in your churches and you don't bother to, you know, you don't read the information that's out there. So you're not exposed to a lot of what's going on. And in, in a sense, that's probably a good thing. But on the other hand, uh, you are ill-prepared to deal with somebody in your own family or that you work with or something like that when some of this stuff begins to come out. And your son, for example, comes home and says, Mom, Dad, now I believe in God, but not the way you do. I believe God's feminine. I believe in a goddess. And I believe the Bible is a corruption of the Jewish race. I believe the Apostle Paul was a lunatic and that, uh, that, he has, that, he, that he tried to create a whole new Christian religion. I don't believe that the New Testament is inspired. I just believe it has inspiration in it. And so I reject all of this stuff that you've been taught and trained, trying to teach me. And so I've, I've chosen my own path, and I'm going to go down this path, and blah, 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 blah. And that's exactly what's going on today. So this is why the emerging church, you remember me telling you about the emerging church? The emerging church movement today is like a chameleon. It, it, it changes. It, it flows with the stream. It is what it needs to be. You remember when I told you last few days, I don't remember when, but he, this preacher was talking about us being relevant. We need to be relevant, he says. And so therefore he said that the New Testament uh, that was written 2,000 years ago is not relevant for this age, 2015. It's, it's anachronistic. It's out, of the, it's out in the past. It's out of this time slot. It doesn't belong here. So it's up to us today to find our own spirituality. It's up to us today to tap into the spiritual flow of wisdom and, and the movement of the spirit. And for us, because I mean, after all, we are, we are so smart. We're so much smarter today than they were before, aren't we? I'm a whole lot smarter than my grandfather was, my great-grandfather. Why, good night, I'm brilliant. <laughs> That's the philosophy. That's what's going on. Now, what do you think they're being set up for? Now think about this for a minute. How many of you ever heard of the alignment of the planets? All right. And that's a phenomenon that takes place on a regular basis, the alignment of the planets. All right. These people believe that, uh, that, has, that ha these people that have had the, this wisdom passed down to them from the builders of the cathedral and even beforehand, that the, that the constellation Virgo that has its corresponding uh, connection with the earth as above, so below, uh, they believe that at the right moment when the planets align, that there will be a corresponding manifestation of great spiritual power on this earth. They believe that. And that they believe that, and that the virgin 
the, for example, Chartres Cathedral and others, they have a virgin about to give birth. Now, have you ever seen the Virgin Mary uh, depicted anywhere about to give birth? No, she's already given birth, right? But in these cathedrals, they have the Virgin about to give birth. It's not Mary. It's the goddess. And the goddess is about to bring forth, remember now, their concept of virgin and ours is entirely different. The goddess is about to bring forth the Christ spirit into someone on this earth who will lead mankind into a new age of peace and glory and prosperity and joy. And all we have to do is wait for the right moment when the planets align, as it's laid out in the cathedrals in France, and when that moment comes, then this is going to take place. It's going to be manifested, and the world will be ready for it. They will be ready for a Christ. You know, the Lord said, if it, Paul said, if a man comes and preaches another Jesus, you receive another spirit, I'll bear well with him. This Christ is going to show up, and when he shows up, the world's going to be ready for him. Now, what, how do you get people ready? You dumb them down first. The church is 35 miles long and a quarter inch deep. You dumb them down. The church is all built on feelings and emotion. You dumb them down. Then you make them feel like you build them back up again. That's the way they do you in the military. Man, you talk about, they call, they call me stuff in there I never heard in my life. And then they told me I was a Marine the last night I was there before I got out of boot camp. See, they tore me down and they built me back up. But they built me the way they wanted me to be. That's what's happening now. They're building people up now. They're brainwashing them. Everybody's entitled, aren't you? Isn't everybody entitled today? Don't they think they're so great and so wonderful? Don't they think they can judge everything that's been said, judge you if you say anything? That's exactly, that's, well, that's the philosophy. <coughs> they're building them back up. What happens? The truth of the matter is they're ignorant. And when this spirit being comes on the scene, they're going to be ready to receive him as their leader, their Messiah, their Christ, whatever you want to call him. But they're going to accept him. And when they do this, of course, the elite, the ones who pull the strings, are going to be, are going to be ready on Johnny on the spot to move this whole thing into this coming new age. That's how many people have been prepared. Nothing about a devil. Nothing about a pitchfork and horns and a red devil. It's all about your wonderful spirituality right. and how that you've been lifted up and prepared and you can think so well of yourself now because you have been given this great spiritual discernment and you can do all of this. And this is the kind of stuff you've got to deal with people today. You try to talk to them about the Lord and the Bible. And the Bible says, you failed, son. You're a sinner. You're a fallen sinner. And there's a wall, a gulf that separates you from God. And the only way that you can two, the two of you can be reconciled together is to remove that wall. And the only one that took that wall away was Christ. Amen. And he went to the cross and paid for your sin there on the cross, Amen. shed his blood. And now you can be reconciled to God through the death of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And through his blood. That's the only way that man could ever be right with God. Not through a bunch of stuff you've pumped into your head. It's got to be by what somebody else did for you. Yes. That's the message of the cross. But you don't get that message in the churches today. Far from it. Far from it. They don't want to preach that because they don't want to be told they're sinners. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the main issue that's going on now. Could you not think about it for a minute? Now think about it. Who in the world would have ever thought of such a master plan, though? Such, a, such an appealing, charismatic uh, a technical plan that Satan has laid out there to suck men and women right into his tentacles. And that's exactly what's going on. This, this appeals to a man with an IQ of 160. And it appeals to a man with an IQ of 90. This, has, this appeals. This appeals because it's not judgmental. See? It's not judgmental. It appeals to his ego and his intellect. And that's the very thing that Satan uses. God doth know that the day you eat this fruit, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. In other words, he offered them knowledge, gnosis. 
So how far are we from it? We're not from it. We're in it. <laughs> we're right smack in the middle of it. But anyway, she says, I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a Hindu. I'm not a Christian. I, yet I still have a deep connection with God. There you go. And if I could say it in one sentence, that's the sentence. So pray for this young woman right here. Now, let's take a step further. Let's, let's, let's make a practical application of this. What is that? All right, here it is. That thing you hold in your hands there that has the, uh, the virgin, pagan, goddess. You can call her Diana. You can call her Demeter. You can call her Isis. You can call her a lot of different things. Every culture spends it for the, you know, cultural ego. They spend it for themselves, like they're original with it. But the bottom line is, it is a goddess. It is a feminine god. All right? She has a, she has a, uh, a pyramid behind her. And then in the front is the coexist. I don't have time to get into all that right now, but I want to, tell, I want to fast forward you to the pope. How many of you know who the latest pope is over there in Rome? All right, Pope Francis. Now, there's a fellow out, uh, I forget his name. Uh, you remember a uh, thing I did about a year or so back where this is supposed to be the last pope. You remember that one? The last pope. All right, now, I'm not saying I believe that or not, but I'm saying he's saying it. Uh, but in any event, this fellow is a Jesuit. All right, Ignatius Loyola started him, started back in uh, 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 hundreds of years ago, the Jesuit movement the intellectual arm of the Catholic Church, the Jesuits, the teachers. Now, this United Religions Initiative, we hear more and more about it. Listen to what this man says. Pope Francis has close ties to many members and especially to its founder, William Swing, a former bishop of the Episcopal Church in San Francisco. When Pope Francis was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he invited Mr. Swing to celebrate the United Religions Initiative's 10th anniversary in Latin America at his cathedral. Remember this, birds of a feather flock together. I remember hearing that when I was a kid many, many times. Do you know what's, it's true. You're known by the company you keep. The URI is a United Nations project heralded 1995 Bishop Swing, a cult earth worshiping interfaith service he was invited to conduct for the UN honoring the 50th anniversary of the signing of the UN Charter. Attending the service in San Francisco's Episcopal Grace Cathedral were political luminaries, representatives of all religions, including Britain's Princess Margaret, Anglican Archbishop Desmond Tutu, South Africa, Polish President Lech Waliza, UN Secretary General Butrus Butrus Ghali, Archbishop Renato Martino, Vatican Nuncio to the UN, and Archbishop John Quinn of San Francisco. Uh, Pope Francis' openness to other faiths is part of a trend at the Vatican. A post today on the Wild Hunt noted that on the recent trip to Brazil, Pope Francis met with representatives of Candombele, C-A-N-D-O-M-B-L-E. I've never heard of this bunch. If any of you have, I don't I have no idea. If the Pope embraces reconciliation with this group, Candombele, uh, with real human interfaith, uh, interface between leaders, why shouldn't Catholics also embrace practitioners of voodoo or indigenous African religions or modern paganism for that matter? Indeed, the Pope's new attitude is needed more now than ever before. We live in a world where human beings fueled by religious beliefs are persecuting and killing one another in increasingly disturbing incidents. What better time for a Pope to emphatically embrace an interfaith mission a mission that has been blunted during the papacy of Benedict, but now hopefully will bear new fruit. What's that? What am I saying? I'm saying that the head of the Roman Catholic Church uh, has a lot of Roman Catholics dead set against him. And I've read now, even in the last week, where Catholic priests are saying that the Pope is going to hell. I've never heard that before. <laughs> That's quite a thing to hear a priest say that his Pope's going to hell. <laughs> if he doesn't change his ways. But in any event, the idea is that you're seeing once again what the Catholic Church has always been in the past. It has accommodated all of the gods, the goddesses, the religions, and everything in whatever country it goes into. 
and changes their names and changes a few things so that the people can be comfortable with both their paganism and Catholicism. But what we're doing here is coming down to the end time and we're coming quickly. We're coming very quickly. I think much faster than a lot of people would, uh, would admit. We are, uh, when I say we, I believe that the true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are in the definite minority in the professing church. And I have no way of knowing how many. I don't know. God's the only one that knows that. He reserves that to himself. I have no way to know that. But I do believe that we are in the minority. And I do believe that the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is very soon. Because we are seeing the very foundation now beginning to take shape of this coming man of sin, this Antichrist. Revelation 13, he's there right at the door, and he's, and he's going to be here sooner than you think. And when he does show up, and the Bible tells you in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, the day will not come except that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And that day he's talking about in 2 Thessalonians 2 is the day of Christ, not the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, and you're going to see him. So that means that if the Lord could come tomorrow to take us up to be with Him in the clouds, that we have already seen the man of sin alive right now. It doesn't mean that He knows He's the man of sin because he has, His life is cut into two distinct parts. First part is the man of sin. Second part is the son of perdition. But He could be very well somebody that you have seen right now and, you've, uh, and you know. And... <laughs> How much closer can you get than that? I've given you a lot of stuff this morning. I really have. <laughs> uh, this is stuff that I've been digging around on now for over a month. And I'm going to go back over a lot of this now and put it together. I didn't even cover the labyrinth. In the Chartres Cathedral, in the cathedral, in the floor of the cathedral, there's a huge round thing. And you enter in, and you go through this, and you come through here, and you go through here, and you go around through here, and you come around here, and you go around here, and around here, and around here. And you go all the way around until you come and go out of it. That's called a lab labyrinth. It's not a plaything. There's a purpose in it. When you go in there, you're connecting with spirits. Now, that is, that's, that's, that's almost 900 years old. Think about this for a minute. Churches today have labyrinths. Churches. They have their own labyrinth. If you want to do a little work, a little extra search this afternoon when you get home, just type that into your Google. Google it on the computer and Google labyrinth. L-A-B-Y-R-I-N-T-H, I think. But uh, Google's very forgiving. If you get to, you know, if you get close to the word, it'll usually find what you're looking for. Uh, spelling can get you in trouble in a heartbeat. <laughs> All right, we'll have word prayer and we'll pick it up again next week. We'll make some more connections, folks. Brother Ronnie Crane, will you dismiss us?